Hello everyone, my name's Ed Parsons. I'm afraid I'm only going to be presenting to you virtually. I would have uh, loved to have been at the conference, but unfortunately some travel issues I had on the morning of my presentation prevented me from doing so. But I'll try to present to you now uh, what I would have said, and uh, hopefully you'll find it useful. My contact details are at the end. Do feel free to get in touch via email or via social media, and I'm happy to continue the conversation. So what I wanted to talk about is a, a change that I think is happening in our industry where we are moving from uh, a time perhaps where we regarded ourselves as, as artisans, as, as developers of, of code, as a, a craft, to a time where the world is, has fundamentally changed. And much of that has been driven by the emergence of, of artificial intelligence, but not, not totally. Uh, let me start off by just describing who I am and, and making use of actually artificial intelligence to do so. Uh, this is the response that Bard gave me, so our chat GPT equivalent of uh, answering the question, who is Ed Parsons? And I think this is largely content that has appeared probably from, from Wikipedia and other content on the web uh, to tell me that I am a geospatial technologist, which actually is true. Uh, I am the Google Maps guy in many ways. That's the easiest way of thinking about it. Uh, I'm uh, really interested in how we make sure that Google Maps is is current, up to date. It represents the the world as accurately as we possibly can. And also things like making sure that that little blue dot that appears uh, on the map to represent your location uh, is done accurately as possible. So I come at, at open source really from a data point of view. You know, data is is almost 80% of what we do in terms of, of building Google Maps. So you may have seen this idea, this, this, this statement that the data is the new code, particularly in the context of, of, of AI. And I think we can draw a comparison to that uh, perhaps less than a helpful statement made earlier that, that data was new oil. I don't think any of us really thought that that data was a, a, a commodity in the same way that oil is. But I think looking at data in the context of how we develop software and how we develop new services actually is really important. And data is a new code, I think, encapsulates this idea that actually many of the new products and services are very much dependent on large volumes of data to make them work. But our focus is not just on on AI and on, I suppose, machine learning to use a perhaps more correct term for what we're actually talking about most of the time. There is actually a confluence of forces that are impacting on the open source community uh, that have emerged around the same time. But uh, I think we need to look at them uh, together because they they bounce off each other. They have impacts on the same idea um, at the same time. So what are these, these forces that are, that are emerging at the same time? Uh, the first, obviously, is this one around uh, machine learning and machine learning training. Uh, how do we manage, how do we control access to data sets uh, which are going to be used to, to create new foundation models, for example? Um, how do we understand and accept the concerns that many content providers have that, well, they, they didn't realize when they were publishing data online that their data was going to be used uh, in this fashion, uh, in a way that you know could be seen that they are being replaced by a machine during their particular activity. You can understand this from authors and, and perhaps the, the creative types, but actually you know, your code that you may have uploaded to a repository is used to train software development tools uh, that will help uh, individuals write code based on the code that you have written. Now, you can understand why people might be resilient to this, not wanting that to happen, but uh, the flip side of that, switching off large sections of the web to prevent people using this could have many negative consequences. We don't want to balkanize the web any more than it already is. Certainly don't want to switch off sections of the web uh, to prevent people from using it for one purpose as opposed to another. The web has grown to be, you know, the enormous value that it has been largely because of, of open access to it. And the other element here that is about the sort of diversity of the ecosystem around 
uh, machine learning and foundation model development is that we have to recognize that the, the barrier to entry is actually quite high and we don't want a situation where it is only the large system providers the large platform vendors that can build foundation models that have the access to data and the computational resource to develop models we need to work hard to create an AI ecosystem that is diverse, that allows you know, individuals or smaller communities to access, to participate, uh, to take the technology in directions that are that are different, that are, that are perhaps counter to what some of the large organizations are doing. How we do that, I think, is still an open question, and it's not one that is going to be necessarily straightforward to, to solve. But particularly, I think there is value in focusing on that data access point and making sure that everyone gets access to the same data to train their models. Uh, at least that's something that we probably can control where the parameters that goes into the, the particular models and their how they are developed uh, perhaps will always be a bit less transparent. And we, we need to be really careful about the language that we're using here when we talk about an open ML model. What do we actually mean? Now, the second change in, in focus, I think, the second, second force that we need to, to worry about is a focus on regulatory, on regulatory uh, insights and, and regulatory access to software development. It's a reflection of the modern world that we live in. The, the modern world is very much driven by software systems. If you think about you know, the many uh, activities you do uh, during your day-to-day -day lives, many of them are controlled by software systems that are by their very nature complex um, and, and complicated and multifaceted and have very long and complicated um, uh, uh, mechanisms behind them. Unsurprisingly, uh, policymakers and regulators want to understand how this works and want to be able to regulate that uh, a bit more than they have done in the past because we've seen where you know harm has come to individuals to organizations where software systems have failed in europe particularly i think this has come to the fore with the emergence of the cybersecurity resilience act um, and in many ways this has introduced this idea of, of accountability for code creation you know the old uh software development uh, uh, license uh, common uh, term of you know, no warranty is, is no longer uh, accessible, I, I guess. It's no longer acceptable uh, to uh, policymakers, probably no longer acceptable to individuals who uh, may be impacted or by software that, that doesn't work or uh, ends up with providing uh, uh, decisions that are difficult to understand or, or not uh, transparent. Software development, working in technology is my day job. My real passion though is actually in aviation. I am a, an aviation enthusiast, an av geek, and I want to draw a parallel between the software industry and the aviation industry. In the early days of the aviation industry, these are the Wright brothers. Everyone was an artisan. These guys ran um, a bicycle shop. They built bicycles and from their experience moved from building bicycles to building aircraft. Uh, this is the, the Wright Flyer uh, in 1903. Now it's in many ways, you know, they were perceived as, as artisans. They were craftsmen. They knew their trade. They built what they did. And to be honest, there wasn't a huge warranty with their air product initially. Uh, they killed many of their customers because this was an emerging field and everyone knew the risk that was associated with the early days of flight. But very rapidly, uh, that had to change. People had to become, as manufacturers of aircraft, much more responsible for what they did. Processes had to be implemented that controlled and managed the construction of aircraft. I'm uh, working with a team at this point in time who are building a a Spitfire, and, and this is uh, a um, photo of the workshop, very much like any other workshop you would see, with individual components of the Spitfire that are hand-built by rolling um, aircraft-grade aluminium, 
Uh, but you can see there are little yellow labels inside the plastic bags that contain the various components. And they document the construction of that particular component by the person that built it and by the supervisor that checked it. Uh, so, you know, I guess drawing the analogy in the old days where you used to be able to develop software anonymously that came with no warranty, that's no longer going to be relevant in the age of things like the CRA. We will have to have that similar level of documentation uh, with what we do. The, the fundamental infrastructure by which we build software is changing in the same way that the infrastructure that build aircraft is changing. Likewise, uh, the modern industry, as you'd expect, is, is, is highly regulated. Uh, quality and responsibility will become, like they are in the aviation industry, pillars of, of how we operate. And this is where that overlap with the open source community, I think, operate uh, works at the same time. How do we make sure that uh, this increased requirement for documentation um, means that we can carry on without the... Uh, software industry being buried under requirements to develop lots more uh, technology, lots more process to, to allow us to, to develop software. We're going to need to create some sort of a compromise to allow us to do that. But, but I'm sure we will be able to, to move forward. Part of that, I guess, comes with the recognition that you know there is a new landscape here. We need to recognize the fact that we will need to work much more closely with legislators. Now, in the past, we can see examples where that hasn't necessarily worked, where there hasn't been a, a good communication between technologists, software developers, and legislators. Uh, a key example of this is the equal regulation. You may uh, be aware that there is a button in your car in Europe, particularly because the legislation requires it, that you can press and you will be put in touch automatically with the emergency services and the, the car will share information with those emergency services uh, about your location and so on. The legislation was very prescriptive when it was written and it required the cars to communicate using a 3G cellular network. As you'll be aware, perhaps, those 3G networks are being currently switched off, but yet you can buy a brand new car today and it will have a 3G based equal system, even though that system is not likely to operate when you take the car out. And that's an example of, of poor legislation where the communication broke down between the technologists and the legislators. The idea was, was absolutely right, uh, but it was, it was poorly crafted. What we want to make sure is, is that doesn't happen in the future. And to do that, we need to be in the room where it happens. We need to be active participants in these communications. And I think, to be honest, around CRA, perhaps we uh, allow the discussion to be, become a bit too confrontational. Um, and I think to keep the open source ecosystem healthy, we need to be active participants. Uh, often that means meeting in rooms like this one with no windows and going through perhaps some quite dry discussion. But I think we need to be active participants. What is Google's role here? Well, we remain committed to uh, open source. We remain uh, wanting to be stewards of the open source ethos. You know, we have had some challenges in terms of uh, uh, how we're able to do this over the past year, but we'll, we'll keep on moving forward. We'll keep committing to things like Summer of Code, but we need your help as well. We need you to be active participants in these discussions. There is going to be a requirement to talk much more probably with legislators as that focus looks on uh, AI and, and, and software from a, um, a perspective of, of uh, control in, in some ways, but uh, we need to be part of that debate. So we need you to be participants, participate in whatever communities you feel comfortable with. And I think the the interesting part of this debate over the last year or so is that there's been quite a diversity of discussion. There are many different groups talking about this. Uh, there is a lot of uh, political visibility of this, and, and it's important for us to to be active participants with the rationale, with the idea behind it, that we want to keep a diverse ecosystem where as much of uh, the access to this 
uh, is is as open as is possible. So look up and keep up with uh, software and foundations as they emerge in this space. Be active participants in the mailing list. Reach out to the academics who are looking at this. And yes, Google does have some interest in this space. Look at things like ML Commons, where we're trying to develop uh, and a common approach for training data sets for machine learning. But increasingly, I think you know the the message I want to to communicate is, let's move forward together. You know, we are a, a big player here. We have some abilities that perhaps individuals smaller contributors don't have in terms of talking to legislators, but but we want to understand the broad view of the ecosystem in this space. Uh, we don't want the, the, the process to become too bureaucratic, too driven only by, by the large vendors. We want an ecosystem that is healthy moving forward. So do keep in touch, uh, do be vocal in your views, but do so in a constructive fashion. As I said, I think a key change in our industry is that we are going to end up talking to legislators, to policymakers, much more than we have done in the past. Whether that's done as individuals, that's going to be really difficult. So perhaps work with the foundations, with the organizations that you feel best represent you moving forward. And, and we will be as, as active in participating in that process as we possibly can be. So once again, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I couldn't make the conference in Bilbao although I did get to the airport, so the aviation enthusiast of me uh, ticked that box, but it wasn't really the same. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, I look forward to hearing any uh, comments, any questions you might have. Get back to me uh, via my email or via social media. Uh, and once again, thanks for your attention.